Well, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues and faculty and staff of Maryville College for coming to this last lecture and for their cooperation during the 31 years that I have worked here. I'd like to thank you, my, uh, thank also my students and graduates for being here. Some of them have come from far. Um, and also my wife and son and daughter-in-law who hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> um, I want to thank the guests from the community and from out of town uh, for honoring me with their presence. Before I applied uh, for, for an economics teaching position at Maryville College, I had already heard a lot about the school, thanks to its missionaries overseas. My wife and I were missionary kids, and then after college, we went to uh, West Africa, to the Republic of Benin, uh, to work as mission volunteers. And in the course of all of that, we met the daughter of Maryville College President Lloyd, Louise Palm, who worked at Silliman University, a Presbyterian university in the Philippines. We met Commodore Fisher, who worked in Iran with uh, Dean Bolden, and Margaret Flory, who served as chaplain here at Maryville College during World War II when the men were all off at war and later uh, served on the board of directors of Maryville College. We actually met more Maryville College graduates overseas on the mission field than we did Princeton graduates, <laughs> which is not surprising since Isaac Anderson, founded a, who founded our college, did so because he could not get Princeton graduates to go to the frontier to the hard life here. <laughs> um, we have been grateful to work at this institution and to live in this friendly and beautiful community uh, for these 31 years. A last lecture should be about big ideas, and it should also acknowledge the influences who gave us the big ideas, and that's what I'm going to try to do today. Um, behind every lecture, uh, in each book, behind each course, behind the liberal arts in general, there are some very big ideas, and Maryville College takes them very seriously. Um, in particular, at this lecture, I'm going to talk about what should a professor do, what is the big idea behind a book, how is economics related to Christianity? That's just a little side, side note. And how do all of the above relate to the liberal arts? First of all, what should a professor do? Well, to profess is to avow publicly. And the best way to, to learn how to do that is to find a role model. Um, in my case, it was Dr. Dean Bolden, who used to be a, uh, a dean in uh, Tehran at Damavan Women's College uh, until they threw him out. And one of the pictures is there in his angry Ayatollah face. <laughs> and the other is his more distinguished face when he became uh, academic vice president of Maryville College. Um, what is a big idea? Well, ask Dr. Keith. Um, she was our professor at, uh, of education at the college and constantly reminding us that we, who went to graduate school, loved books. Our students needed something a little more uh, uh, structured in order to learn in. And so her statement was, use big ideas in order to relate the facts and keep coming back to the big idea. Uh, in her absence, ask somebody who knew Dr. Keith. I wanted to give some, uh, an example of the big idea that I use in my African Studies class 
Uh, many of the people are here and are familiar with them, and some of them are going to be helping to illustrate these. These are Africanisms, and according to Holloway, these are pieces of African culture incorporated into American food, American music, American language, and American social institutions. So let's take a look at these, and they will seem very familiar to them, at least some of them. For music, um, that's easy. We've got jazz. We've got gospel. We've got blues. Rock and roll? Well, where was Elvis Presley's uh, influences from? Um, in Mississippi. We also have rap. One of the characteristics of many West African languages is that they are tonal. And so it makes a difference whether you say me or me. One's I and the other's you. Um, and as a result, you can't really put a melody on them because you will change the meaning of them. So the result is a sort of singing that is generated around rhythm than around melody. And that is what has been picked up with rap and banjos as well, which were African musical instruments picked up in the United States um, and have become pretty much quite, uh, quite musical instruments uh, today. Well, we're familiar with examples of Africanisms in music, but let's get a little more cl close to home for everybody. Uh, when it comes to food, coffee originated in Ethiopia, and just ask Yosef about it. <laughs> cola came from cola nuts from Africa. French fries, uh, the whole tradition of frying vegetables in uh, deep fat, originated in Africa, or at least the version we got. French fries came because uh, the GIs in World War I liked them over in Paris. And then there's peanut butter, and I wanted to give an example of peanut butter. So Glenda and Seth, do you want to <laughs> dramatize that for us? George Washington Carver, why are you pulling a long face? Mama, I have a way to fertilize cotton fields by growing peanuts, but I cannot find a way to dispose of all the peanuts. Well, I focus on peanut butter on bread. That's a good idea. Should I tell them about mixing it into stews as well? Stick the peanut butter. Wasn't that what confused them? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Peanut butter is a West African dish um, since long ago. Guinea hens, okra, Spanish rice is really Senegalese rice. Uh, watermelons, of course, originated in Africa. And Cajun cooking. Those French people from Canada who went down, who were sent down there by the British, didn't know how to cook uh, with the local ingredients until they arrived. And they took the ingredients mostly from African Americans. Another example of this is in language. Multiple verbs. A lot of the things that our English department very efficiently runs out of people's vocabulary uh, grammar came from Africa. Uh, because I done gone did it, or uh, I go, well, um, you can think of the examples. But the originals in, in Africa were, were um, you would do, you wouldn't bother to put then into a sentence. You just did one verb right after another and assumed that the actions were taking place in sequence. For instance, I go come chop em plenty is a direct translation from Ingun for um, I'm going away, coming back, and we will eat a lot together. <laughs> Chop as in chopsticks. Um, here's another Africanism. And so let's hear, hear about that. Do you know the African words? Uh-huh. 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 No, uh-uh is an African word. Get it? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, at least 
in the, in the sense that African Americans use it is come into everybody's vocabulary. The idea of big man and small boy is a very African concept because in Africa, age counts. Mm -hmm. And the best way to put somebody down and tell them to be quiet is to say, I was there when you were born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, but we also have some uh, American cultural uh, activities that are like Africanisms too. Thank goodness for morning showers. Europeans took baths on Saturday night. That was it for the week, folks. Um, the Boy Scouts originated when General Baden Powell was in South Africa and his urban uh, troops couldn't find their way out on the West Africa, you know, on the South African grasslands and were dependent on 16-year-old Zulu boys. And he came home having found out how the Zulu boys were trained and proceeded to create the Boy Scout, uh, um, the Boy Scout movement on that model of boys leading boys in order to learn uh, necessary life skills. Cowboys are another one, and we have two cowboys here to talk. Why does a man want us to build a fence for cows and then bring the food to them? We could tend them the African way by taking them out to find a pasture and staying with the herd. So why would the man agree? Just like in Africa, he makes a deal that when we bring back the herd, he chooses half the cows that he wants and we get the rest. <laughs> That way, we make sure the cows are healthy. <laughs> oh, he won't let you have a gun. In Africa, we had no guns to scare off the lions. If we had them, we would not be here. So, I guess bears won't be a problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our actors from African Studies Class. <laughs> Midwives originated, uh, or at least our experience in North America from Africa. Uh, uh, when, when Southern women started discovering uh, that, that they were better taken care of by women than they were being by male doctors. Um, women's property rights first developed in the state of South Carolina, which is notable for having a majority black population. And this was because African-American women had property rights and white women didn't. These were property rights in their tradition. They took into marriage and they took out of marriage with them. And as a result, uh, the white women wanted the same rights and spread it through the American population. And Br'er Rabbit is a Ghanaian folk figure uh, as well, an Africanism in American culture. So why don't we recognize that these Africanisms came from Africa? One reason, of course, is a racist assumption on both, uh, on both sides that white and black are separate cultures uh, and different in, in the United States, when really there was a tremendous amount of sharing that has taken place uh, historically. But there's also another historical reason for this, the median date of arrival for African ancestors was in, or before the, uh, the American Revolution in 1776. The median date of arrival for European ancestors in North America was Ellis Island in the 1880s. The result is that uh, African Americans' ancestors were here over a century before most white ancestors were here. And so when people got off the boat in New York, whatever they met there, they thought was American and didn't ask questions about whether it had come from somewhere uh, else. Uh, it was that, that was not their experience. So Africanisms are an example of a big idea uh, something that will pull our uh, uh, number of details that we can pull together to remember 
uh, about the nature of American culture and where it has drawn itself from. Maryville College professors have big ideas, and I hope you are all aware of that fact. Uh, big ideas are best developed in books because you are aware in that, uh, in writing a book, that you have to explain where the uh, idea originated from, what the different positions are on it, and reach a conclusion. When we're writing uh, articles in journals, we're just part of an ongoing debate, and aside from references, referencing different points of view, uh, we do not have to explain to the reader what was uh, going on. I've made it a pleasure during my 31 years here to read the books by, read almost all the books by Maryville College professors. Uh, during that time, including Dr. Bogart's books uh, since then. The only one I haven't read was published, well, got in our library last month. Um, so it's been there. But So I'm going to take you on a tour through a few of these in hopes to excite you about the big ideas in them. Uh, we all know uh, Professor Treve Trevathan and I am especially interested in his books because I have a canoe, I have gone paddling on the Tennessee River, I have had hair-raising escapes on the Tennessee <laughs> River, and I have had some disgusting experiences on the Tennessee River. But above all, I've had the chance as well to have a feeling of being part of history and the environment out there and to be very much a human being learning from what is around me uh, as I'm paddling along, uh, getting good exercise and sweating. Um, I think his book is very easy to get into, and yet it's very profound, and I recommend it highly. My own attempt at this uh, is a trade in death, um, it's an economics murder mystery based in Africa, uh, and assigned to my African studies classes. Um, it was modeled on a, a friend of mine whom I traveled through Africa with, a Kenyan sociologist, uh, who, was, who was with me going through six different countries in Africa. And we started off in Senegal and Gambia, Togo and Ghana, and in West Africa, the poor man was really culture shocked. And by then I had been in West Africa for 15 years and was looking on everything as very normal, but he kept saying, there's so much culture here. And I didn't know what he meant until I got to East Africa, where nobody says, hello, white man. And in West Africa, if they're not saying hello, white man, it means something's going down and you better get out. Mm. And I got so nervous in East Africa because <laughs> they're different there. So the story is about a Kenyan economist in a West African country, and this Kenyan economist has to process the experiences in exactly the same way an American would, and therefore is a vehicle for seeing African culture from the inside. Next, there's Drew Craig. Um, I don't pretend to have understood the chemistry, the mo molecules, or whatever in there, but he answered a very big question for me. How can a minuscule amount of lead, or he other heavy metal, or a hormone like estrogen, can have such a devastating effect on my family or a large alligator. Um, it really is alarming and enlightening uh, what he has gone through in terms of research and um, I, I challenge other people to, especially those not in the natural sciences, to try to read and understand uh, the import of what he is saying. Um, Dr. Lachlan uh, was another of my 
uh, enjoyable experiences. In this case, we, uh, my wife and I had worked in a West, French-speaking West African fr uh, country, and we had Breton uh, volunteers in the area who, like the Celts everywhere in Ireland and Scotland, are the most charming people, storytellers you could ever have around, and singers. And so I was very interested in her book because of the way in which it analyzed how Celtic traditions in France were very different from the Latin, the Roman law that was imposed on the west of, rest of France, uh, which kept all of the power in the hands of the patriarch of the family, whereas the Celtic traditions gave women a great many more rights and therefore uh, a different history uh, than uh, took place in the rest of France. And then there's Dr. Kim, who retired here about seven years ago, um, and who is, who is a Korean with the largeness of spirit to study Japanese manufacturing, uh, because it was hard for him to do so. Um, but together what we discovered from our students working in uh, Japanese uh, transplant factories was how much uh, change took place, uh, both in terms of uh, Japanese bringing new ways of doing things to American communities, but also of the Japanese discovering uh, over here in a, a solutions to problems they didn't even realize that they had. Um, these four senior theses, one of them uh, was uh, by Mrs. Noriko Chapman, who is still working at Denso. Another one by Larry Thomas, who was involved in trying to deal with problems of repetitive motion disorder or cumulative trauma among the workers in his plant in Van Or. And what it, the, the Japanese um, owners did not believe this was happening and they thought the Americans were malingering. Yeah. Eventually he started contacting Japanese doctors and discovered they had the same problems back in Japan. They just hadn't bothered to tell the factory owners. Hmm. The foremen and so forth were covering up to not to save face for the factory owners. So when the Americans discovered uh, ways of automating certain parts of the job that would protect the health of the workers, they immediately installed them in Japan to the benefit of all. Um, Manami Miura worked here in our international, with our international students and did a study on culture shock among Japanese wives. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kim and I did a study on attitudes towards Japanese investment in East Tennessee. Finally, I'd like to, uh, to say how happy I am um, that Dr. Russell Parker's book has now been um, bound and is in our library. Uh, I had read it in manuscript form. Uh, I had the privilege of doing it uh, while he was still alive and then was very disappointed to find out uh, that we had no way of finishing the editing and getting it published because it's a very interesting study of the history of the city of Alcoa. Um, and it says that progressivism, which was the philosophy adopted by the uh, company in running this uh, as a company town, for its first, uh, first uh, 30 years of existence um, was the result, uh, resulted in very modern urban management and uh, some great discoveries and also <coughs> organized uh, integration in the community and into the factory. Um, it was paternalistic at the same time and he does a very fair job of evaluating what this experiment in uh, progressivism meant for the city of Alcoa, and it gives a very good idea of how much has changed 
since the 1950s when it moved on into a, um, uh, a system of uh, democratic elections in Alcoa. Well, I have talked for 20 minutes, and according to Marsha Keith, one is supposed to stop and have people pair up and discuss the big ideas. So I am going to give you the five minutes to do it. Uh, and please think about what is a big idea. What is a big idea so far in this lecture? How are the little ideas related to it? and maybe any other big ideas you have in courses that you want to share with the person next to you. So please go ahead and do so on time. <laughs> okay. Well, we will have time for questions during the, the party after this e event. Um, and let's go on, uh, since we're right on time here, and see the economics part of the last lecture. Um, first thing, some definitions. Uh, economics is based on the word oikos, which is the Greek word for household. And this is a patriarchal household, you know, run by the man of the house with the relatives living and the slaves and everybody living within the same uh, area. Um, it's interesting how many other words are derived, contain the word oikos in it economical, uh, economics, and I have two definitions here. One, of the very general one, the study of production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services, which applies both to a commercial economy and also a pre-market economy. And the other one, uh, the study of rational choice, choices in the face of scarce resources, uh, which is the one that our textbooks use, applying to a, uh, a modern uh, commercial-based economy. Um, the word ecumenical also comes from the same one, referring particularly to the church related to the whole world. Um, but today we would uh, refer to it in somewhat, uh, the word globalization in somewhat the same way. And ecology comes from the same household idea uh, written larger, uh, including uh, the plants and animals, uh, the organisms, and their relationship to their environment. Um, I, in my courses, I've had the I had a freedom here at a church-related college to try to bring the religious aspects of a lot of different topics, and so I wanted to mention just a few of them. Uh, since I've invited some of these courses to be here. Um, one of them is in economic development, and we, what we have covered is the role of religion in agriculture, because the system of land ownership is justified in terms of religion. The understanding of how people relate to creation is part of agriculture. Um, and then also the influence of, of religion, both in terms of, of uh, either stimulating or discouraging education is very important, as is the influence of religion on what the role of women in society is, and how, the, how uh, religious institutions will relate to the kind of problems that are created when human beings uh, start collecting in cities, and these, these problems become social problems. Um, and the way religion impacts people's desire to migrate, uh, both within a, a society and between societies, uh, is very important as well. So both in agriculture and also in uh, industrial forms and uh, services, uh, economics is economic development is very much related to religion. And what I do in my classes is I have people meet together uh, doing studies of individual countries where they're talking uh, in groups of the dominant religion for each, for each country. Uh, so all of the people uh, studying Latin, American Christi uh, Latin America are talking about Christianity. All of those who are studying Asia 
Uh, if it is a Buddhist country, a Bu if these are Buddhist countries are, are talking about the effects uh, in Asia and the Europeans talking about European Christianity. Um, I've had some experiences uh, talking about economics in macroeconomics course, and of course, we had to have a linear regression here. Um, I had a student about 20 years ago who did a senior thesis depicting, uh, predicting church giving in uh, 12 different American denominations. And I wanted to give you an example here uh, with the Presbyterian Church of the kind of thing that you can come up with. You can predict um, Presbyterian contributions in constant dollars uh, as a, an equation, negative 1.05 million plus $387 per Presbyterian member per year, more or less. Uh, if you add members, it's $387. If you lose me a member, on average, it's $387. Plus $72,000 for every increase of a dollar in uh, real personal disposable income in the United States. So the church as a whole, the denomination as a whole, would have more when the economy is doing well, less if the economy is doing badly. Um, and for every point uh, that inflation goes up, uh, on the consumer price index, uh, less uh, the church receives 15 million less. I don't think people fail to pay the contributions they agreed to do. Uh, it's just that a year later, those contributions aren't worth as much, uh, and so there is less. And what he did was he went and found that in, as long as a denomination is more than a half million members. Uh, these uh, ex these predictions wind up being quite accurate. In this example, the adjusted R squared is 93.7 percent. That means 93.7 percent of the variation in income uh, can be explained with this uh, equation. In African studies, we've already mentioned the the novel about a Presbyterian Kenyan economist. Um, I also ask people when they are learning about African uh, traditional religions uh, what Christianity would look like to somebody who was raised within that tradition. And the result are some very interesting ways uh, because Proverbs are important in the tradition. The book of Proverbs has to be there in any Bible that people read uh, because Prayers in traditional religion are like psalms. The book of Psalms is very powerful. Things like that happen as people carry over their own culture into Christianity, and in some ways it's very revealing, um, both about their, their own religion, but also about Christianity. Psalms are more powerful than most of us uh, take, uh, take seriously. One of my most enjoyable experiences, although a scary one, was to teach a senior seminar on Christianity in a diverse, diverse world. And basically what I started looking at were the periods of major <coughs> mission expansion of Christian churches. And it took place originally through the road and um, seas of the Roman Empire, then along the Silk Road in both directions, both towards Asia, but also down into Africa on the Silk Road. And then uh, when the European alter explorers went out to find an alternative to the Silk Road, because that's what those explorers were doing. The, the reason they wanted to get to Asia was they knew valuable goods were there, and they didn't want to pay uh, the middlemen uh, on the Silk Road uh, the costs of getting them. And then finally, uh, with the easy transportation by plane and 
steamship that has occurred in the 20th century. And if you look ahead on the internet is where a great deal of expansion is taking place uh, as well. But I can't continue without mentioning Adam Smith, especially since the history of thought class is here as well. And I want to start off by saying that most of your textbooks are wrong. <laughs> there, he never mentioned the invisible hand. It was an invisible hand. And in two books of about 800 pages in all, he mentioned an invisible hand three times. Um, he very much favored free trade. He was inter against interference in the economy by the British royal monopolies. He was against having his country having colonies. He was very progressive um, in all of those senses, but the invisible hand was not his major interest. Um, his major interest was competition and the value of competition. And he did this as a moralist. Uh, he recognized that self-interest is basically sinful, but the advantage of competition is that it controls greed. Uh, through competition, it controls greed to serve human needs. Um, in a sense, the, the sinful nature has been turned into a, a much more productive outcome. Um, he was very aware, though, that competition could be undermined in many different ways, some of which we have experienced um, in the United States. Uh, one of his famous statements is, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Um, so he was seeing competition not as a, an achievement, but as a constant struggle in order to uh, realize the advantages of competition. <clears throat> in the 20th century, um, mathematical economists tried to prove that a free market would, well, would function well independently of outside interference. They were the ones who came up with the invisible hand as the most important uh, feature in, in Adam Smith's uh, ideas. Um, and these, this uh, attempt has gone from Walrath, Walrath uh, in, through Samuelson and most recently in Rational Expectations to su uh, assume that rational people operating in free markets will work out solutions um, that are durable and robust uh, and the best for the economy. Um, Adam Smith also was very realistic about the need for good government institutions and he was in favor of democracy. And what he, peculiar, what he especially wanted were a good legal framework for a society, an efficient national defense that did not cost too much and did not cost too much in taxation either, um, public works and the provision of public goods like lighthouses uh, that, that would be very important for the efficiency of the economy. Well, we have um, at this point looked at liberal art, uh, I've been sort of skating around my final big idea, and that is liberal arts as the big idea. Um, we, I'm going to suggest that one of our uh, educational goals that we have been talking about in this uh, presentation has been the creative and critical uh, exercise of scientific, artistic, and humanistic modes of inquiry and their integration. Can you think of an example of that? Africanisms? 
Um, a sense of wonder, curiosity, and a willingness to explore. Reading all your books. That was fun. Yours especially, it was well written. <laughs> Uh, um, but also, uh, you know, the history of Christian mission is, a, is an exercise in exploration as well. Um, and the third educational goal, informed ethical judgment, which, uh, which guides one to make choices leading to a responsible life. Coming to Maryville College, that's a good one. Thank you, you've been well brainwashed. <laughs> Great, I, I was thinking smaller than that, but that is the biggest idea you can take home with you. <laughs> Majoring in economics, that's another one. Okay, very good. Well, my purpose in, all, in doing this uh, is not only to, to uh, to emphasize what we have done in some of my courses and what my students have achieved and most of all what my uh, colleagues have, been, have achieved. Um, I'm also wanting to just remind us all of the richness of Maryville College as an institution uh, in all of the senses. A, a institution that is rich in art, a institution that is rich in skills, uh, that are an institution that is rich in um, an institution that is also rich in uh, literary pursuits. Um, and the, I have been proud to have been part of this college community uh, which, has, uh, which seeks to embody these goals. And I thank you for having been here with me to celebrate this. <laughs>